Our scripture reading for today comes from the Gospel of Luke, the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 10. Hear now the good news of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling, saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and he eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me. For I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. About a week ago, I was uh, I was at the dry cleaners picking up some stuff, and and I was waiting in line behind a man. I was second in line, and it was just the two of us there. Um, when the man reaches into his pocket to pay, and and when he reaches in to grab his cash, just a one lone coin rushes out of his pocket onto the ground. And you know, sometimes you reach in your pocket, you don't even know you have a coin there because it's lodged in between the folded bills in your pocket, and when you grab it, it just slides out. It's a rather common story. I mean, we see this all the time. Nothing about this story was exceptional except for what this man did once he dropped his coin. You see, he started looking for that coin. And he didn't just look right at his feet, which is, that's what I would do if I dropped a coin. When I drop coins, here, here's what I do. I drop it and I look at my feet. I look to my left and I look to my right. And if it isn't in front of me, I move on with my day. That's it. If it's not within in eyesight, just I don't even turn around. Won't even go to that much trouble. Down, left, right, if it's not there, that's it. I lost that coin. And one of the reasons I do that is, is because I hate to hold up people. I hate to be an inconvenience to people. So that's why I don't search for it. I don't want people to wait for me. Also, too, what is 10 cents to me or a penny or even a quarter? How much do I think about that? But this man at the laundromat, he started searching you see, he put his head down. He heard the, that clanging of it rolling away. He puts his head down and he just starts walking around. This man casually strolls behind the counter at the laundromat. He doesn't see that. He doesn't even know what he's doing. And he just keeps going. He goes back into where they keep all of the clothes hanging up, which is behind a door. He walks through the little opening. He doesn't see it there, so he doubles back around. He goes into the little office they have off the side behind the counter. And you can, I mean, as I described, this was just shocking to me. I couldn't handle it. I was, I was giggling inside. I didn't know what to think. It felt like this whole time was going in slow motion. Because I was like, how could you do that? Who would do that? Who would stroll behind the counter for a coin? And then not just that, go into their private office looking for your coin. 
I just couldn't understand it. It felt like it was taking for, it really wasn't that long. He probably looked for less than a minute for that thing. And I wasn't, you know, I wasn't in shock because I had anywhere to be. I was in no hurry. It didn't, it didn't cause me any pain or nuisance to, to wait an extra minute for this man. Um, but I just kept on going back to just, who does that? Who searches a coin, for a coin that hard? Who cares that much about a coin? And if you're like, I do, well, I bet I can go to your house right now, look in your couch, and you will, I will find coins that you didn't even know you lost. And so if you're trying to say that you care that much about a coin, look in your sofa when you get home, and you'll find coins that you didn't know. It come, I'll find coins in my own sofa I didn't even know I had. But this man... This man at the laundromat, I think he would be the type of person who would be like, no, you won't find a single coin out of place in my house. And so when Jesus tells us a parable, and it begins, which one of you, which one of you, he says, which one of you, if you lose one of your sheep, doesn't leave the other 99 and go look for it? Which one of you, when you lose one coin, doesn't spend the whole day looking for that one coin. Which one of you, when you lose one coin, doesn't tear apart the laundromat? And the answer, I bet everyone sitting there, everyone who was at dinner with Jesus that day, when he asked this, which one of you? I can just imagine every one of them is thinking, Jesus, none of us do that. Jesus, you're talking about a reality that none of us know. Because it makes no sense. We can theologize and do all we want, but I don't think it makes sense to leave 99 sheep in danger to get one. I can do, I can do math, simple math, 99 is bigger than one. See, it makes no sense to search for one coin when you could just go out and work and probably make more than that one coin is worth. Jesus, none of us would do that because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense in this world. Which one of you? None of us. But Jesus doesn't stop there because I think Jesus, um, I think Jesus um, knows that there's some, some people who might want to suck up to him in this moment. Some of those would be like, uh, pastor, pastor, but I'm just like that man at the laundromat. I, I'd search it out. Or they'd be like, Jesus, I would do anything to find the lost sheep. Or, Pastor, you won't find any change in my sofa. I think Jesus recognizes there's people that'll say that. And so Jesus goes on to say, and then which one of you, once you found that sheep, or you found that coin, which one of you doesn't invite the entire town for a party? Which one of you doesn't invite the entire town once you find that? So just imagine this. Now I have, I spent all day, I found my quarter. I found my dollar coin. We'll give it a dollar's worth. And so now Jesus says, you found it. Now go to Walmart, buy all of the hot dogs and hamburgers and chips and soda you can to feed the entire neighborhood. So you can celebrate finding a silver dollar. No one does that. Jesus, nobody would do that. That doesn't make any fiscal sense. But Jesus asked it so nonchalantly, which one of you wouldn't? And I think we're all like, yeah, yeah, of course I would, Jesus. Yeah, yeah, I would do that. I would search out that coin or that sheep. But we wouldn't, we don't, we haven't. And maybe that's the point of this story. This story is not one to shame us into. I'm not trying to shame you and saying you don't search like Jesus searches. I'm not trying to shame you and saying you should look for all those coins because I've already said I'm not going to. I've admitted that. 
But I think the point of this story, or one of the points of this story, the good news of this story, is that Jesus will. Jesus will search like that. Jesus, when he finds the one, will throw a party, even if we won't. And the good news is that it's Jesus has a joy that doesn't make sense to me, and it doesn't make sense to us. Jesus' joy is illogical. Jesus' joy is not reasonable. It makes no financial sense. It's not practical. And yet still, this is what brings Jesus joy. Reaching out and finding the lost is what brings Jesus joy. This week, I've been just bombarded everywhere with this idea of joy. And not that it's, it's been an extra a joyful week. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how everywhere I've gone, it seems like I'm asked the question, what does joy look like to me? I had a whole paper assignment this week. I had to write a five-page paper on just the question, what is joy? joy. That was the prompt. What is joy? Not what does this old dead person say about joy? Not as what does the Bible say about joy, but what do I think about joy? Let me tell you, that was the hardest paper I think I've ever written. Just simply, what is joy? I went to a meeting with pastors and there was, there was a long table with tons of pictures on it. And our instruction was to pick two pictures that bring us joy? Really simple questions. I had a little easier time with that, but there were so many pictures and I was like, what? Does this bring me joy? And now we have in this text, and I'm reading this text and, and with all these questions of what is joy, I have to take this to believe that Jesus here is teaching us what joy is. Jesus is teaching us how to have joy in our lives. And I don't know if it's, you, if it's just me or if you notice this too, but I don't think there's enough joy in this world. I don't think people have enough joy. I watch the news. I watch sports. It doesn't seem what you, whatever you turn on TV, it seems like there's not enough joy. People are arguing and getting mad at each other over everything. You turn on the news and you just get bombarded with, with sad story after sad story. Conflict after conflict. And we're just, we're, just, uh, we're just hoping for a little bit of happiness. I don't know if you watch the, the Today Show, but Rachel likes to have that on and I watch it sometimes. And, and they do what I think it's called Hoda's Morning Boost. It's a really, it's a quick 30 second clip of happiness just to get your morning started. But we have, but, which is a great thing, but it's surrounded by a bunch of terrible things. So we're hoping that that 30 second morning boost will get us through the hour of terrible things. And that doesn't make sense to me. The 30 seconds of joy to get us through all the sorrow. And it's not just the news, it's even in the church. We ask these questions, we focus so much on the struggles in churches. How are we gonna bring, how are we gonna pay the bills? That's not a joyful conversation. I don't think anyone's ever had joy with that question. Why aren't there more people in the pews? It's not a joyful question. Where did all the kids go? That's not a joyful question. Why aren't people in this country religious anymore? It doesn't bring me joy to ask that question. And don't get me wrong, these are real concerns. These are concerns we have to be, to take notice of. 
But my question is, how often do we talk about joy in the church? Because I think we ask these questions a lot more than we go, what brings you joy? You see, when I wrote that paper about joy, I also had another paper due at the same time for the same teacher that said, what is suffering? And I flew through the suffering paper. Didn't have to think about it at all. And I struggled through the stories and through the paper about joy. How often do we point to joy in our communities? How often do we notice what God is rejoicing over in our world? Because I think God is rejoicing in this world. I just think we need to point it out. I'm starting to think that maybe the reason that the church doesn't have a robust theology of joy or an appreciation of joy like we do suffering and sorrow is because we don't take these stories seriously that I read this morning. Or I don't. Because we get bogged down in the repentance. It says those who repent will rejoice in there. There's stuff about righteousness. But really when it gets down to it, Jesus is just talking about rejoicing and having some joy. Psalm 16 says, and, and if you're with the Breakfast with the Psalm crew, you know this, that uh, David, I think, has a problem with joy. You read through the Psalms, and he's a, he's a pretty bitter man a lot, really, really down and depressing sometimes, but he gets joy right occasionally. And so in Psalm 16, he says, You show me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. You see that there's something connecting life and fullness of joy. The path of life is joyful. In God's presence, there is a fullness of joy. And so if we're searching for joy, if we're trying to grab hold of some joy in this world, if we are searching for moments in which Jesus in this scripture throws parties and rejoicing, when can we throw parties and rejoicing? I think we may need to find the presence of God. This, show, this story here, notice where Jesus is. Notice where the presence of God, Jesus, the shepherd, the woman who lost the coin. Notice where they are. You see, Jesus is out in the wilderness. He's not in the safety of the sheep's pen or of town. Jesus is in the nooks and crannies of the houses. He is out in the hills and in the valleys. He is climbing over rocks and getting into caves. He's traveling. He is in the attic. He is behind the refrigerator. He's under the sink. He's climbing on the roof and checking out the carport. You see, Jesus is stubbornly looking everywhere. Even those places that make no sense. I think if we're trying to have a fullness of joy outlook, I think we need to be compelled to find the presence of God in this world. And I'm sorry to say this, and this... I struggled saying it this morning at Herman, this line. It's really easy to write. It's really hard to say out loud. But I think if we're trying to find a, a fullness of joy, we need to find the presence of God, which may not be in the church. It certainly can be. It certainly is. But I think a lot more often it's not in the comfort of our living rooms. But it's in the wild wilderness with sinners and the broken. The presence of God is out in the wilderness of life with those that are not allowed at the table. You see, Jesus tells these parables because the Pharisees come to him and he go, then they go, Jesus, why are you eating with these people? Jesus, why do you want to have dinner with these sinners and broken people? 
Jesus simply says, because that's where God is. I want to eat with them because that's where I'm supposed to be. The presence of God is at the table with sinners and broken people. I believe Jesus would say, if you're looking for joy, you should probably go to where you aren't supposed to. You aren't supposed to eat with sinners and broken people, but that's where Jesus is. You might need to get out of the church. Not the church family, just out of the walls. But also notice this, when does the party happen? The party happens after a lot of hard work. The rejoicing happens after Jesus has returned with the sheep or with the coin. The rejoicing begins when Jesus has decided he's not giving up. When Jesus simply decides that the search is worth it. Church, I wonder how much more joy we would experience in this world if we saw the search for lost sinners not as a waste of time like I do when I drop a coin, but as the source of of our rejoicing. What would it look like if we relentlessly, and I would argue foolishly, decided to join Jesus in searching for the lost in this world? And we decided to join Jesus in doing this, not just until we got tired, not just until it made, didn't make financial sense, What if we searched out lost sinners, not just until we had enough people to make budget for that year, but we relentlessly and foolishly searched out people. Jesus shows us that what brings joy is simply finding the lost. It is, it is in being with people who, for some reason or another, the church has said, you deserve to be lost. It's searching out the people who says, you're not worth searching for. It's in finding people who, who we have said, it doesn't make financial sense to find you. It's inviting people to the table, not just who belong, but inviting everyone. Because this is what brings Jesus joy. It says it. With much rejoicing, he invited people to party. I'm not saying we're not searching for joy in this world. I'm just saying we might be searching in the wrong places. We stress out about so many things that we believe if we are able to accomplish, we can find joy. If I just do this, then I will have joy. If I just get my child into this prestigious school, then I will have joy. If I just make VP, then I will make, have joy. If I just get that new car, then I will have joy. Maybe harder. If I show up to church, then I will have joy. We all have these ideas of what will bring us joy. I have ideas of what will bring us joy. If I just graduate with a good enough GPA, then I will have joy. And I think the question we need to be asking ourselves when we talk about joy is the one I've been bringing up. What brings Jesus joy? And what doesn't bring Jesus joy? Because having 99% of the sheep doesn't bring Jesus joy. But finding one who is lost does. Makes no sense, but that's true. Having a full bank account doesn't bring Jesus joy, but finding the one that is lost does. It makes no sense, but he says it. Having to deal with theological disputes doesn't bring Jesus joy. But eating with sinners and outcasts does. That doesn't make sense, but it's true. Having to sit in meetings discussing things that we never find the solution to doesn't bring Jesus joy. 
what feeding the multitudes does. Dealing with church politics doesn't bring him joy, but teaching the little children does. You see, we spend so much time focusing on those things that don't provide us joy. And those things are important. Having a balanced budget is important. Keeping the lights on is important. But we shouldn't be looking for that 30-second boost in the midst of an hour's worth of unjoyful things. That ratio doesn't make sense to me. Because Jesus is a cause for rejoicing. I believe we as a church need a joyful renewal. We need to flip those ratios. We need to spend more time pointing to the joy in this world and less time focusing on the sorrows. Because I believe this Christian life should bring us joy. It should be joyful to be a Christian. Sure, it's got struggles. I talk a lot about the struggles. I know it in my sermons. I talk a lot about the struggles. And I think we need to focus on some joy sometimes. Maybe more often. Definitely more often. I think this world could use a little more joy. And so let us find the presence of God in the wilderness of this world and receive a fullness of joy. Let us gather with sinners around the table and receive a fullness of joy. Not just a little bit of fullness. Let us not stop searching out the lost until all are found. And then we will receive a fullness of joy. Let us foolishly. It's foolish. None of this makes sense. None of this makes sense. So let us foolishly search out those who are lost, and then let us even more foolishly rejoice over it. Let us have a joy that makes no sense. And let us not be driven into this world by fear. But rather, let us be driven into this world searching for a fullness of joy that is only found in the presence of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Psalm 16 says, You have shown me the path of life. In God's presence, there is a fullness of joy. This life should be joyful. And when we find the presence of God, there too we find a fullness of joy. Amen.